The psychedelic revolution is here. If you want to integrate your visionary experiences into your purpose, get clear on your entrepreneurial path and help people while you do what you love, then this podcast is for you. Welcome to The Psychedelic Entrepreneur, medicine for these times. I'm your host, Beth Weinstein. I'm a spiritual business coach, three-time entrepreneur, and a lifelong student of psychedelics and sacred plant medicines. You carry your own unique medicine, and your medicine is what we need for these times. This podcast will help you to share your medicine so you can create transformation in the world. Listen in on conversations with psychedelic leaders, change makers, and conscious entrepreneurs who are living proof that a better world is possible when you follow your heart and live in alignment with your soul. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. I am here with Simon Ugler, who's coming to us right now from Colorado. Hey, Simon, how are you? Hi, Beth. I'm great. Yeah, nice to talk to you. Thanks for being here. So we're going to get into it. And let me tell you a little bit more about Simon, his background. So with a master's in depth counseling psychology from Pacifica Graduate Institute, Simon is a depth and psychedelic integration therapist based in Portland, Oregon. Weaving Jungian psychology, internal family systems therapy, and mythology, Simon also draws on his diverse experiences learning from indigenous cultures around the world, including the Shipibo ayahuasca tradition. He has a background in anthropology and experiential education and has led immersive international journeys for young adults across 10 countries. Currently, he works as a therapist with Myco Meditations, a psilocybin-assisted therapy retreat center in Jamaica. He is passionate about initiation, one of my favorite subjects, men's work, decolonization, and helping his clients explore the liminal wilds of the soul. Simon, you are living the dream for many people, um, working in Jamaica, helping people, working with psilocybin. Um, Can you tell people, the first question I always like to ask, tell people a little bit about how you came onto this path. Um, what was your career journey and how you ended up doing this incredible work that you do now? Sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, I often like to share a story about being a young and arrogant teenager, just <laughs> dipping my toes into the psychedelic uh, realm, you know, growing up in Portland, um, finding medicines, finding drugs was never a hard thing to do. <laughs> and I had a handful of quite positive mushroom experiences. So of course I knew everything as a 16 year old. Oh my God. And I remember getting a bag of some of the most beautiful, um, and potent looking psilocybin cubensis mushrooms I've ever seen. And my friend's brother saying, please don't take all of this. And I looked at him and said, yeah, okay, sure, buddy. And, you know, a few days later, found myself in a situation with my friends where I started getting very scared as it seemed like my my friends just kind of um, were d- dissolving into these strange sort of creatures. I felt very scared, very alone, and just decided to sleep that experience off. Uh, which, you know, as we both know, isn't going to happen. So um, basically got thrashed. I really got my ass handed to me as a teenager. And I remember coming out of that experience the next day, you know, after eight hours of just being in a psychedelic hell realm, saying to myself, all right, there is a right way to do these things. And there's a wrong way to do these things. And I would really like to learn what the right way is. Mm -hmm. And that misadventure kind of put me on a path of trying to figure out what the right way is. And, and, And that, you know, started with things like anthropology and studying religion in college to a lot of international travel um, towards kind of moving into the space of being a guide and educator Um, and finally finding my way to psychotherapy. Um, And I couldn't have predicted that the psychedelic renaissance, as it's called, um, is pairing so synchronistically with, you know, my career as a psychotherapist. So that's the short story. 
Wow. I love I love that story. It sounds a lot like me, that arrogant teenager that thought this was all fun and games until it wasn't that one day. Um, no, I'm curious, you know, did you have the intention, like, let's say when you were in college studying anthropology or whatever, did you have the intention of becoming a therapist? Because that was because I also very much like you, I grew up on the West Coast working with acid and mushrooms at the age of 14 onward. And um I went to school to become a therapist and then that has not happened yet. <laughs> maybe, maybe 10 years from now, who knows? But um, right. was that ever your intention or were you just going to go into academia or a totally different career? I had no idea. I, I didn't <laughs> know I wanted to be a therapist. Um, I was fascinated with shamanism and psychedelics and all kinds of weird stuff, you know, in college, um, I had the opportunity to go to some, you know, um, plant medicine ceremonies when I was in my twenties, but no, I had no idea I wanted to be a therapist. I just knew, you know, I was just fascinated with, um, indigenous cultures. And I just knew that part of my life needed to be spent, um, spending as much time around some of these people and some of these cultures as, as possible. So that mm -hmm. took me to Aboriginal Australia when I was 20 mm -hmm. and different countries in Africa and spending time with, you know, indigenous people in the Middle East and finally um, Peru. So. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Amazing. And I assume, have you been on dietas in Peru? Like that kind of work, like the depths of... <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I did a, a pretty solid dieta there about six years ago and um, really, really wanting to get back, really missing Peru. So. Mm, yeah, no, it's it's beautiful. And there's a whole other podcast episode I did just on dietas. Um, but well, let's talk about what you're doing now. So um, you're working at a retreat center in Jamaica. Um, there are a lot of listeners I know out there who are listening saying, oh, that's my dream is to, you know, open my own retreat center or partner with a retreat center or become a facilitator or, you know, be able to work with these legally um, all the time and work with my clients. How did how did you fall into this and what kind of work is it that you're doing with the retreat center specifically? Right. So I'm I'm a therapist with micro meditations. So. Um, honestly, the, it's like most things, especially like with people in the psychedelic world, um, like most things, it was a lot of synchronicity coming together at the right time and being in a situation in my life where I, um, had the opportunity to say yes to drastically shifting and changing a lot of very foundational elements of what my life looked like to be able to do that work, um, but as far as kind of what sort of the, the, the stepping stones were that put me in, in, in this, to be able to do this work, um, you know, spending three years almost getting a master's degree in depth psychology, working, you know, in psychotherapeutic internships and community mental health in Portland with refugees and, and other kind of uh, low income folks there. Um, and then, I mean, but really like a lifetime, uh, almost a lifetime, or half my lifetime of just kind of continuing to orbit around, um, this question of psychedelics and, you know, getting feedback from friends and, and, um, colleagues in graduate school of like, you know, this seems to be something you're really passionate about, man. Maybe you should <laughs> look into that. Um, and yeah, just. I, I think a combination of factors being um, fortunate enough to grow up, like you said, on the West Coast, where, you know, one, medicines and drugs are abundant for, for, mm -hmm. for good or ill, um, but also just like continuing to kind of put the time in, continuing to study from an academic level, continuing to do my own work with, you know, like we were just talking about dietas, things like I've only done one dieta, um, but... Mm -hmm continuing to have a relationship with particular medicines. In this case, I would say psilocybin and ayahuasca are the two that I've spent the most time with, but really prioritizing, you know, that's something I tell people um, when 
folks will reach out to me and say, hey, how can I get into doing psychedelic work? What's the first thing? And I always say, do your own work. Yeah. Like get a deep relationship with the medicine that you're looking to um, serve or facilitate with. If it's psilocybin, you know, whether if that looks mm -hmm. like um, working with a guide or going somewhere where it's legal, like the Netherlands or Jamaica, um, doing it on your own, which is a little bit more dicey for some folks, mm -hmm. or, you know, doing a more traditional training like a dieta um, in Peru or something to that effect. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's a wild West world out there and, um, we'll see how this all plays out, but I agree. It's, you know, it's not like, okay, do it once. And now you're serving it. It's like the, the, to me, and this is my personal opinion is my biggest work has come through my own work that I've been doing with the actual medicines and then really deep work with integration, like, been doing somatic therapy and IFS, you know, internal family systems therapy for years, um, working with many different healers and coaches and therapists that also understand medicines very well and have helped with integration. Um, and let's talk about that a little. I'm curious because you're at one of the known retreat centers out there. And I'm curious, like, what is their process when it comes to, um, Someone who flies to Jamaica, and I, I assume they go there because they want to have a safe, held, um, big experience or maybe multiple experiences. But what is the process that you take people through? Is it, you know, preparation and integration? And what do you recommend for people who are integrating? Because we all know this is a, a huge conversation to be had. <laughs> right. It's a great question and something I feel like we could talk for hours about, but <laughs> I'll know. try to... Kind of, yeah, I'll try to kind of condense it here. So at, at MICO, what we do, we, we screen people, first of all. So, you know, we screen out people who might have um, counterindications, right, in their family history, in their own personal history. So, you know, I, you know as, as a lot of people will, will say, integration kind of has three parts, right? Preparation, the actual dosing or the psychedelic experience, and then kind of the post integration after the fact, right? So we do preparation work with people when they arrive. We do, you know, the first full day of the retreat is basically a four to five hour integration and preparation circle where people share about who they are, what has brought them here, what they're hoping to work on, how they're hoping to change, you know, and people share things that they've never mm -hmm. said before to anyone else. Um, and then kind of interest first with that, we, you, we usually kind of offer education about like how the experience is going to go, what they might feel, um, you know, kind of tips and, uh, tricks for navigating the psychedelic space because we also get a lot of people who have never taken psychedelics before. So, mm -hmm. you know, giving people tools like breathing and staying centered and trust, things like that. Um, and then, you know, after each dosing session, we do three doses on each retreat, mm -hmm. which, which is a week long, um, after the next day, after a dose is after breakfast, you know, most of that day is spent in integration circle where we'll spend three or four hours again, going around in a circle and people sharing very much, very much like, um, what people would imagine like group therapy being like, except mm. the psychedelic experience is really front and center. And myself, maybe another therapist there will ask follow up, follow up questions about certain aspects of their journey or things mm -hmm. that happen or things that didn't happen. You know, sometimes people are really upset because the thing they wanted to happen didn't happen. They didn't get the kaleidoscope <laughs> rainbows and unicorns, but they got something else. And usually a lot, a lot of the time our job is helping people understand that, you know, um, whatever you got was what you needed, even if it wasn't what you wanted. Um, and then once people leave Jamaica, there's, there's a lot of WhatsApp groups and kind of um, micro meditations community that we plug people into. But it's something that we say on the team, like we can always be doing more and better integration. Mm -hmm. um, I like to think of integration as not something you do 
and then you're done with, but it's actually a lifelong yes. process and a life path. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm constantly saying, I'm like, integration is every minute of the day, every moment, you know, I have never stopped integrating and I have, I was actually just on a previous interview and I, I said, I'm like, I have cut so far back on medicine the last few years. You know, I still work with it, just not as much as I used to, like not as heavy and deep because the integration, it's like, the, it's, it's like every day feels like a ceremony, you know? Um, I'm just curious, like what kind of dosing, because I've always wondered this and I know there's a lot of listeners who have dreams, including some clients of mine who you know, they're coaches or they're healers or they're doing a combination. And then they're like, well, I want to host a retreat at a, a retreat center, or I want to send clients to one of these retreat centers and then help them with the before and after. Um, what kind of dosing are people getting at these might go meditation type places? Like, are there people doing, you know, mega doses or is it kind of like, you know, to each their own. Some are taking eight grams and some are taking one. Um, I'm just curious. Yeah, that's a great question. I can't speak for other retreat centers. I think yeah. kind of like, you know, um, like what happens in Peru, each place has different medicine and each curandero has a different way of doing things. So I would say the same goes for what's happening right now in Jamaica. That might change down the line in the future, you know, in, in three, five, ten years, right, with, with government regulation, but that's a different mm -hmm. conversation. Um, I can I can speak for what we do at MICO, which is that, you know, we start people usually at three to five grams. And depending on what they're working with, depending on how they respond, depending on what is kind of emerging and what is coming up with them over the course of their retreat, usually that dose will go up over the course of the week. Um, but again, you know, a lot of people coming to us are working with decades of treatment resistant depression mm. or PTSD or, you know, all manner of things that have um, not, they haven't found any relief from through therapy, mm. through medication. So a lot of people come to us um, kind of at the end of the rope. So mm. we're really going to try to like wow. help people and really break through some of these patterns that people have been carrying around for sometimes decades. Wow. This is incredible. Cause yeah, you know, someone like me reacts to like five grams as like, that's a high dose for me, even though it's, you know, it's, I've me done too. it, but um, yeah, I'm like, <laughs> but then, yeah, I forget when you're, you know, at this point in your life and you've tried everything and you're, you know, trying to break a pattern or a core wound or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, this is where I've even considered like, well, that one thing in my life, maybe I need a boga because I don't know what else can work, but, um, that's fascinating. So I assume these are smaller groups. They're not like 30, 40 people in a group or yeah, they? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, wow. It's, really it's, deep work. Yeah. The smallest group I've worked with, I think was seven. And then the largest I've worked with is about 12. That mm -hmm. is also, I mean, COVID regulations have it currently. So groups are a bit smaller, but honestly, like seven to 12 is pretty great. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, it's definitely not like the 30 person ayahuasca <laughs> rock concert thing that happens in some places. Yeah. Hundred, hundred, which I've heard about and sounds oh, scary my to goodness. me, but no judgments, but still, I think it's unbelievable. I don't know. I'm like the, the biggest I've ever sat in with anybody is like 22 people, you know, that was big enough. Um, but let's get into some of your other work. Um, you know, I was telling Simon before this that I have been working with, a somatic therapist who also has studied internal family systems and how, um, and then I've actually been studying it as well through a program that I'm in and how mind blowing this work has been, how this has been the key to my own integration process. Um, after my first yet, uh, five or six years ago, that was when I was like, huh, maybe I need, maybe I need some help with this. Cause that was pretty damn deep. Um, you know, so let's talk about this work that you do. And, you know, you mentioned men's work, you mentioned initiations. Um, what has been coming up for people, especially the last year and a half? Like, have you noticed a lot of 
shit hitting the fan, essentially, um, with, you know, the state of the world and, you know, you throw in psychedelics, you throw in um, uncertainty, you know, lots of people changing careers. Like what's, you know, what are you noticing patterns and um, the work that you're doing you know, how is this helping people, you know, I'm assuming, like, do I, should I assume most of your clients are on the medicine path or is this like kind of separate work that you're doing? Um, it's not separate. No, most of my clients are men. Currently all of them are men. Um, I, I say some, I mean, something I really deeply believe is that men need a lot of help. Um, and most men aren't getting it. Mm -hmm. So I really, you know, prioritize and focus my practice towards working with men. Um, and yeah, my ideal clients are people who are working with medicine on their own, who have past medicine experiences and are kind of, you know, on the path, like we just said a minute ago, integration mm -hmm. is a lifelong thing. So, um, yeah, those are people I love to work with. I mean, your question, Beth, about like what I've seen in the last year and a half, is like so big. I feel yeah. like, um, I feel like I've seen a lot of people, um, sadly kind of, yeah, kind of lose it and really struggle in, in a lot of deep ways, both clients and friends. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Um, what I can say is that something that I've spent a lot of time thinking and writing about is this idea of the archetype of the underworld. And mm -hmm. I think both psychedelics, and both, you know, uh, something like disease or a pandemic or a trauma or a tragic loss or a separation, whatever it is, you know, um, there's this idea of the underworld and kind of delving into the darkness. And I think that's what has been happening collectively for a lot of people. I can't really imagine a single person who hasn't at least felt the cold winds of the underworld blowing on them at least at some point in the last two years um so you know that's how i conceive of kind of this moment that we're in collectively um is that we're kind of in this underworld journey and um you know there's an interesting pairing with psychedelics because psychedelics are often kind of a descent into something dark or scary or hard and um, personally, I feel like psychedelics have helped prepare me for COVID and, and all of the disruption and destruction that, you know, has occurred over the last year and a half because it's like, okay, yeah, this is what's happening right now. I've been here before. Yeah. I know this will change. I know to just like stay focused and breathe and to like, to, you know, keep my eyes on the prize or the goal or the intention or the prayer, or whatever it is. So that's what has helped me through this. But yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. that's how I kind of conceptualize this through like a Jungian or depth psychological lens mm -hmm. is like, yeah, we're on a collective underworld journey right now. Yeah. So, so well said. I'm laughing because I have literally had three interviews in a row about this exact same subject. Um, and of course, this has come up so much in the last, you know, couple of years. Um, but I, it's interesting. I had written email to my community. I have an email list, you know, that I've had for whatever it's five years now, um, five or six. And I said that, I think it was like really early on, like, you know, the end of March, 2020, I was like, wow, this is, this is the ayahuasca. This is it. Like it kind of, you know, I look at my life and how I reacted to the changes and the upheavals and the anxiety and the uncertainty. And I was like, oh, okay, like here it is. And it, it felt like a very deep preparation. And on some level, and I have talked to many people about this, you know, on some level, I don't know if it showed me very clearly or if it was just kind of this knowingness of the world was going to go through this during our lifetime, whether, you know, whether it was 2020 or 2025 or later on, but it's kind of like needed, right? Like things are not working. Um, the systems are broken. Like humanity is not being served. There's people suffering. Long before the pandemic, there was anxiety, depression, PTSD, trauma, you know, and 
and people not really getting the help that they need, like the last resort, like, okay, maybe psychedelics will help me. You know, this thing I keep hearing about on the news, maybe this is the only answer. Even, even someone like me who's done deep work my whole life, it's like getting to that final straw of like, maybe it's Iboga. Like maybe that's the only answer that's left. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think that's my path right now, but I have gotten to that place. Um, and I really love that you work with men because I know, um, so many people would agree with this that, you know, and I'm, I'm very much like, I have such a love and reverence for men. And I don't believe in this whole like separation of like, oh, well, it's just the, the broken patriarchy. But then again, there is a broken patriarchy, right? Like it's, it's like, everything is intertwined, right? Like our systems and, um, the, the wounded masculine and what's really like laying beneath. And I'm just curious, you know, coming from this kind of psychedelic perspective of, um, and also like, you know, your depth psychology perspective, like what has been happening all these years and are men reaching out for more and more help? I mean, I know in the communities I'm in, there's more men's groups, there's more men's retreats, there's more men willing to go there, you know, a little more than, than they used to. Um, sometimes it's, it's not as much like as the women I know, we're, we're willing to go deep into the darkness of, you know, the initiation on what seems like a pretty regular basis. But what is it that like you think kind of, I mean, I hate to put these, this language to it, but like what went wrong, you know, or what, where did we go wrong? And is there a hope for the future of of the masculine on this planet? <laughs> I think so, mm-hmm. but curious to hear what yeah. you say. Yeah, well, the answer has to be yes, first of all. <laughs> if we're, you know, if we're going to orient towards life, right, the answer must be yes. Mm. Um, and, you know, my master's thesis was spent mostly focused on masculinity and psychedelic initiation as kind of um, a a pathway for healing some of, you know, what, what, what is often called toxic masculinity, Mm -hmm. bit of a clunky term these days, but, Mm -hmm. you know, um, your question of what went wrong, I think is really potent because it, one, it inspires a kind of retrospective look culturally and socially into the past to kind of examine our culture and, the slow kind of fading away of a significant spiritual and ritual and therefore community oriented life. So I would say what went wrong, first of all, I mean, it's a huge question and I'm not going to pretend to like actually like have all the answers. Uh, it's like everything. It. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but what I would say is like um, what went wrong culturally speaking is the complete movement away from initiation and rites of passage specifically for men um, because rites of passage um, essentially work by cracking open someone's ego and their psyche to open them up to something that is greater than themselves um, opening people up to the idea that yes life is sacred and things are worth protecting and things are worth keeping in uh, a certain level of sacredness, right? Um, And yeah, I think also initiation traditionally was always done in the natural world. So having that disconnect from never having, you know, deep initiation in the natural world that really crack open the ego and the psyche, opening people's identity up to, you know, wow, I'm, I'm part of something greater than just me. The, the story of the West, unfortunately, has kind of become so oriented around the individual that at this point, um, I think it was Robert Bly, the poet Robert Bly, who made the joke of the, the rugged individual has now become the ragged individual. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, the story that we've been working out in Western culture um, is is really rapidly starting to break apart. Mm. Yeah, it's. I'm so glad you brought this up. Um, I was just talking to someone about this earlier today. How I just came off a vision quest, my first time doing a vision quest, and how 
you know, traditionally this was part of, this is one of the initiations. It's like becoming an adult, right? Like even just recognizing that we make this transition within our own lives, you know, and not just there's, there's community, there's for the greater good, there's the whole, and then there's like within ourselves. And I'm like, yeah, wow. Our society doesn't recognize this. We're really just thrown in, right? Like, especially, um, you know, I don't know about you, but the way I was raised, it was like my parents were working and everybody was busy and life is, you know, and you're kind of left to fend for yourself at some point. And there is no like, oh, welcome to adulthood. It's like, no, this is this is what you do. And you go to college and you do this. And next thing you know, it's like, wait, what am I doing? <laughs> and there's kind of this lostness. And, um, you know, it's it, we were discussing this right before the Vision Quest, how there's so much of our society being run by people who've been kind of stuck in this kind of teenage teenage or adolescent um, place in life. Like look at a lot of our world leaders, right? Like <laughs> they sometimes seem like arguing little babies. Um, so this is really beautiful that you you talk about this. Now I'm curious, um, do you work with people uh, around um, this work, like initiation and psychedelics? Like is this something you do in therapy or is this like you know, you assign people like, okay, here are certain things you can bring into your psychedelic experience. Like how does, how does this play a role in, um, you know, the work that you do with the men? Um, you know, that's, that's a great question. I would say that if, if prepared for properly and, and taken seriously enough, any psychedelic experience can be an initiatory experience. Mm. So, you know, that's something that I, really encourage people to look at like what is this why have you come to this point in your life right what is taking this medicine going to mean for you and you know sometimes people do have that complete kind of rite of passage one chapter closing a complete chapter opening we see that a lot with people on retreat that they're in a transition um but also uh, i think i've also seen people who um, yeah, really have a hard time re uh, accepting that, you know, whatever kind of uh, experience they might be looking for in the psychedelic space is actually one of initiation, which, by the way, initiation means death and letting something go so that something else can come, right? So, um, I mean, to answer your question, I, I wish I was doing more um, explicit initiation work. I also mm. don't know if I'm ready for that yet. Mm. So um, that might be something, you know, when I'm a bit older, you know, down the line, when I have more experience, mm. where I really know actually a lot more about working with medicine, working with people, right? Um, that is something I would love to do down the line. But right now, mm. I, I still consider myself uh, uh, a student in many ways. Yeah. So. Ah, uh, no, it's, it's beautiful. I'm constantly writing um, emails about, especially this last year, because um, I've been in my own deep initiatory process, which has been so hard and so beautiful at the same time. But I'm constantly, you know, talking about initiations in entrepreneurship, initiations, stepping into your purpose and how deep this goes for people to drop into their heart and actually start to make the first steps to create change in their life and how it's not so easy, you know, and it, it does require, it's like a lot of reprogramming, a lot of throwing away and, you know, letting die that piece of yourself that you identified as for so long, you know, like that, whether it was programmed in your upbringing or just, you know, how you've been living the last 10 years or 20 years of your life. And it's not easy. And this is where it helps to get support. Um, so let's talk a little bit about my favorite subject, which by the way, I almost named this podcast the psychedelic integration podcast, because, you know, essentially what I do is I help people start businesses, but, um, it tends to be a lot of people who are on the medicine path, who want to make a big change in their career, meaning go from something misaligned to mostly people working in transformational entrepreneurship, you know, coaches, healers, therapists, um, so that's why it's not called that. But I do believe that integration is so important and it comes up with everybody. I actually have a lot of clients who are psychedelic integration coaches who, you know, been in programs who want to start bringing it out to the world. What is your, um, 
I have two questions here, and I could always come back to the second one. But one is, what is your favorite methodology of integration, or what do you think works the best? And then also, one question I've been wondering is, why is it that so many people that I know on the psychedelic path have have studied or worked with um, internal family systems therapists? And why is that? I mean, I personally have found it to be so effective. But wh- where's that psychedelic connection. <laughs> I think it's mm-hmm. something in the history from what I understand, but I'm not, I'm not sure, but yeah, yeah. there's, there's a few. Um, I, I actually wrote an article for psychedelics today about internal family systems therapy and <laughs> psychedelics, specifically integration. Um, <laughs> so that's out there. You can just Google my name and psychedelics today and you'll probably find it. Um, there is some history also, like you said, Michael and Annie Mithofer, who were some of the pioneers for the MAPS and DMA protocol were IFS therapists, are IFS therapists, I should say. Mm-hmm. So IFS therapy um, is intimately connected with kind of what's happening right now with, with MDMA works in particular um, through the myth offers, like I just said. Um, mm-hmm. So that's some of the history, but I just gravitated towards IFS um, intuitively. Um, it also pairs with what I feel like is kind of um, my more archetypal or Jungian approach to working with people, specifically psychedelic experiences, which often have all kinds of weird, strange imagery or memories or things like that that pop up. I I kind of treat it like a dream. So Mm -hmm. both Jungian psychotherapy, Jungian analysis. uh, I'm not a Jungian analyst, but I'm trained in in depth psychology. Um, Mm -hmm. But you know, working with images, just like working with parts is kind of, there's a really, um, it seems very simple, but it's actually very, very profound because you're giving the part, if we're using IFS language, or you're giving the image or the archetype, if we're li- using more archetypal or union uh, language, you're essentially giving that psychic formation, that idea, that image, that experience, you're giving that a certain level of psychic autonomy Mm. um, and kind of psychic weight, which is actually very, um, a very powerful thing to do because it actually, um, to do that, you have to acknowledge that sometimes, you know, you're not the master of your own house, that there's these other parts of you who also have things to say, that there's these, um, energies or beings or archetypes or whatever that, you know, you can interface with or access, whether if you want to or not in the psychedelic space who also have their own agency. So that's why I love IFS work. Um, mm-hmm. And it kind of, you know, pairs back to that first question you asked Beth about integrate integration methodology. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I, I use IFS to work with parts of people that come up in regards to, their particular journey, whether if it's like, you know, the part of them that was really scared um, about taking a second dose. And then the part of them that was like, oh, well, you're here, you should do it. So like, those are two parts or, you know, um, parts that come up in the middle of a journey, things like that. Um, I've done some IFS with people um, during a dose, which, you know, um, as Michael and Annie Mithoffer talked about, you know, MDMA psychotherapy in particular pairs really well with IFS because those walls are down and people can really just access and and speak for their parts with like almost no, you know, in in, inhibitions. Um, But I also like to use an archetypal or a depth psychological framework for working with integration um, because there is so much rich imagery and experience that comes up. I really, really do believe that there is a intimate link between the psychedelic experience, dreams, and myth. And that's something I'm personally interested in, in exploring and actually am writing about for psychedelics today, currently, about depth psychology and psychedelics. Ooh, I love this. I'm like, ooh, let's get into myth a little. <laughs> no, um, this is really interesting because I I have never thought of it that way, but it makes so much sense. It's like, oh, I, I've never thought to look at my journeys as the manifestation of these different parts. Um, 
But then again, I've also only recently been like, you know, kind of training in this. So I don't think I understood it at a deep level, you know, six, seven years ago. Um, but this is really interesting. And I do, I personally, because I do have clients who who are also in different forms of training, who are studying this work and wanting to bring it into the integration process. And um, I'm curious what you think about the, because I, I asked most guests this question, what do you think about the increase and the popularity and the growth of all the medicines, you know, all psychedelics, um, the interest. And I mean, do you think this is a positive shift? Is this going to make a positive impact on the planet? Like what is your future outlook? Or is this where, Hey, we just need more integration therapists on hand for, for this, you know, like it just seems like such a huge growth so quickly of people like, oh, I heard about this on the media and now I'm going to try it because I've been depressed for 20 years and I don't know what else to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What are your thoughts on the future of how psychedelics might play out? Such a huge question. I know. Oh, it's, my it's also a big question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like it. I like it. You don't you don't mess around. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I feel like there's kind of two sides to that question. One is for people, like you just mentioned, looking for relief and looking for help, right? And that, that to me is so needed and so, um, it's been so long since there's been any significant changes in the field of mental health, um, specifically with regards to medication. I mean, like SSRIs, I, I feel like that story is so played out at this point. Um, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but like uh, rarely have I found someone who said, yeah, I've been on SSRIs for 20 years. It's great. I love it. Um, so in that regard with, regard, with regards to people needing relief, um, clients, whatnot, I think it's fantastic. I, I think it's one of the kind of redeeming lights in the world right now that I continue to reorient to of like, wow, okay, amidst all of the climate destruction, amidst all of the political insanity, amidst all of the social breakdown, amidst all of the problems, um, at least this is moving ahead. And at least some people who have been so deep in suffering for so long mm -hmm. are going to get relief soon. Um, so that's kind of one side of the equation. The other side of the equation or the other side of the question that I heard you ask is more about practitioners and people kind of stepping into the psychedelic space. You know, I don't, <laughs> it's, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Um, mm. I, I, I can only really speak from my own personal journey, which is like um, wanting to feeling a personal need to be able to, act and speak with integrity to be able to balance whatever authority I might be speaking with or acting with to be able to balance authority with integrity. And to me, that meant going to grad school and becoming a psychotherapist because that's what I needed to do to align those two things for myself. So if I, I think that's a personal journey that people need to sit with is there, you know, are, how is your authority balanced with, with putting the time in? And, and um, I can't say what that is going to be for every unique person looking to be on the, the, the psychedelic path or, or work in the psychedelic field. But yeah, I think, I think personal work, you know, it's like every therapist needs a therapist, right? So doing your own work, um, you know, I think there's, there's something to be said for kind of, there's something to be said for kind of, um, doing what, what do they call it? Trench work, uh, mm -hmm. like, like working in the trenches. I don't know what that's going to look like for psychedelics, mm -hmm. but I think it might have something to do with, with, with having, um, with really investing in yourself right? Whether if that's going to the jungle for a long period of time and, um, you know, doing some really hard 
work with ayahuasca, whether if that's, you know, doing your own personal work, you were mentioning iboga, like whatever it is that you have to do to get to a place where there's enough integrity within yourself for you to be able to do what it is that you want to do, whether if that's be an integration coach, be a facilitator of some kind. Uh, I am scared that we are in such a wild west kind of um, landscape right now um, that I, I am I am legitimately scared that you know some harm is going to occur down the line. I feel like it's almost inevitable, unfortunately. Um, and I hope that that harm doesn't have repercussions for the wider community uh, and psychedelic field. Um, but I think, you know, continuing to have conversations like this about, you know, what, what does it actually mean? What does it take to kind of have a level of integrity? I think it, integrity needs to come before authority, not mm -hmm. the other way around. So. Yes, this is, it's so well said. Um, and it's interesting because this has come up so much in pretty much every interview I've had when I asked the same question, um, to really keep, you know, keep one's ego in check, which is <laughs> the irony is that when people have really big egos and think like, okay, I, I had a really big ayahuasca experience and it told me that I should start pouring medicine. You know, it's like, okay, well, if your ego is so big that you can't even see through the ego that's in that, then that's a problem, you know, and I have constantly been, you know, praying. Um, there's a lot of prayer here, but feeling the same way about, well, if one thing goes wrong, like if, if there's one really big um, tragedy or, you know, a group that gets people in trouble or, or something happens, it could kind of ruin things for a lot of others that are doing great work out there. Um, you know, it's kind of like the one shaman who, you know, goes viral because of sexual abuse. It's like, oh, well, all shamans have, you know, are bad and have this power and authority. And I'm like, well, it's we all know that's not true. You know, I've worked with pretty high integrity people. Um, but then, you know, then it becomes like this general mistrust of like, OK, well, now more and more people are on guard. And and yes, I do believe do your research really, you know, don't jump into things. Um but then again, I'm also trying to take the stance of, you know, who am I to judge? Like your experience in a Brooklyn loft with uh, music playing over a computer is, hey, if it works for you, great. It's not what works for me, but, you know, who's to say what's right or wrong? Um, but yes, definitely harm reduction, safety, and really that that integrity. And that goes for all people, you know, all people in this field doing all kinds of work because there's, you know, it is very like, there's a lot of this energy of like, I want to give back. I want to serve. I want to help out. And I get it because, you know, all of us have been on our own healing journey that have brought us to this place of wanting to serve. But, um, really, you know, this is why I keep asking this question and everybody pretty much says the same thing is it's like, okay, really be honest with yourself. Like, have you done the inner work? Have you done the the studying, the practice, like your own deep journeys, like maybe you're able to help someone this much, but not this much, you know, like where's, where's the level of, um, you know, like help someone microdose, but maybe not give them the eight grams, you know, in a session or, so, or, or, yeah. or take a year, take a year off from psychedelics, yeah. Yeah. you know, like, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, just a thought, right. Maybe, maybe take less. <laughs> Yeah. This is this is my journey. Um, the the interview before you was actually a friend of mine. I was like, you know, it's really interesting. The last, I just I've kept going down and down and down. Like the more, you know, it's like dietas, dietas, ayahuasca, psilocybin. I mean, there's a point where you just become the medicine. And I keep telling people, um, some of my most powerful medicine has been working with some flower essences and just getting onto the earth. You know, like going and staring at the bees that I have in my garden, you know, like that's been mm -hmm. really powerful medicine. And I don't know if I need to blow my brains out for eight hours once a month, you know, because again, like the integration work has been so powerful that the medicine has actually become so secondary, you know, it's, yes, it's still part of my life and I it probably always will be, but it's, it's the minor, the minor aspect, which is mm -hmm. one of my theories is that the medicine is actually bringing us to all this other work, which is actually much deeper on some level 
than the medicine. But, you know, in order to get there, yeah, like maybe some people just need to be having these peak experiences. Um, I had one one last question for you about um, now. Now I'm like completely blinking. It was actually quite important about um, this work that you do and what you would recommend for people. But let's hear, you know, just to start wrapping it up a little bit, let's hear a little bit more about you and what you have going on. And um, I totally forgot what I was going to ask, but it was actually quite profound. And now that I've done like five interviews today, maybe that's why I can't remember. Well, but- well some, <laughs> something you were saying that actually was really interesting to me is about yeah. taking less and less and less. And, uh, you know, it kind of connects to what we were talking about, you know, a minute ago about masculinity and um, something that psychedelics have have taught me with regards to masculinity is, you know, um, I think it's at least I'll speak personally, like there was a thing for a while for me of like, oh, like how much medicine can I take? Right. Like, oh, like how much how many cups can I drink? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, maybe everyone moves through, moves through that. I don't know. But for me, it was a thing for a period of time. Um, how much cu- How much can I drink? You know, blah, blah, blah. And something that really, really hit me through being in Peru and, and working with the Shipibo maestros that I worked with down there was like, they need a symbol full. They need a sip. Like some of these people can smell ayahuasca and are gone and are in the spirit world, right? And... So now at this point, however many years down the line, uh, I feel like really um, thankful, really, really grateful that I can get to where I need to go with a very little amount of whatever we're talking about. And in fact, Mm -hmm. in some things, it's like I won't even go above like what is considered one dose because it's like I don't. That I, you know, that's all I need. So yeah. that's that's something that I'm also really interested in orienting to is like cultivating the sensitivity to medicine because eventually, like you said, you know, as Maria Sabina said, never mm-hmm. forget that you're the medicine, right? Yeah. And 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 have that inform all that you do. Uh, you know, um, it's kind of like um, make your life psychedelic not psychedelic is your life exactly and this is this is actually what happened to me as well was after doing you know dietas like i you know i did four in a row four years in a row and it was even after the first one i completely noticed the attunement with the spirit and the attunement with the plants and you know changing my whole lifestyle from living in a big city to living in you know on three acres of land out in you know the wilderness the country, you know, not too far outside of New York city, but a couple hours. And, um, but now, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, there is that kind of psychedelic experience all the time where I can feel a plant, I can commune with a plant and actually get the medicine from the plant without having to take three cups. And I actually was very much like you as well. It was like, go deep because there's no point on being here unless you're going to be like out in the outer realms. And then, over time, I was like, well, wait a second. I've actually gotten some of my biggest, most profound healing experiences through um, microdosing in the jungle, you know, like little like helper doses, as we call them, or, you know, microdose experiences with psilocybin or just in meditation, you know, like one of my biggest experiences was on a Vipassana. And that's where it's like, okay, there's actually a way to tune into these plants or into any kind of medicine without having to blow your brains out. And I think it's also a lot to do with the embodiment and, you know, like grounding and where's your energy. And I mean, this this is like, we could do like 10 episodes on all that, but, um, this is it. And I'm, I'm so glad you're talking about this and teaching what you're teaching because this work is so important. And especially, um, you know, I, I'm so grateful that you're doing this with men, um, because it's, it's interesting. It's come up even in medicine circles with like the men and the dynamics and, and like that, you know, like the masculinity and like, where is the vulnerability? And it's actually okay if you have a hard, hard experience and you don't man up and, you know, like survive your way through it because all of us will get taken there, whether we like it or Mm -hmm. not, you know, Mm -hmm. the, the dark, the dark underworld initiation, which is actually some of the most beautiful, profound experiences 
that there is, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. One, one, one more thing I wanted to say that you just reminded me of is something I, I really deeply believe and, um, feel like is sometimes missing from the, the psychedelic community or conversation, which is this idea of, of psychedelics aren't, um, meant to help you have a nicer day at the office that actually psychedelics are meant to open us up and on a deeper level, I believe, help us repair our culture, which, Mm -hmm. you know, applies to everything from like we were just talking about masculinity to our relationship with the natural world to this idea of consumption of more and more and more. How much Mm -hmm. can I take? I need more, right? When actually I think the deeper wisdom of these medicines is less and less and less and less until you don't need it at all. It's about mm-hmm. consuming less instead of, you know, proving how much you can consume and, and taking more and more. So psychedelics is cultural repair. That's the last thing I'll say, uh, I guess. Yes. Thank you. It's it's funny because I very often call it, um, especially with, you know, and again, like no judgment, but a lot of new people that are like, I read the Michael Pollan book and I, I just want to take this. And it's that Amazon Prime effect where they're like, <laughs> oh, maybe this will fix everything. And I'm like, actually, it will open up a whole new realm of life and get get ready. But it's it's definitely, it's all intertwined. It's all interwoven. And I do believe, and I'm sure you would agree with me, there's a reason why these medicines are growing so popular so quickly right now at this time in human history is because it's all, it's like as above, so below. It's a mirror for everything that's mm-hmm. kind of broken systems on the planet. And well, mu- mushrooms, you know, uh, yeah. mushrooms feed on decay and death, don't they? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh my God, this is deep. <laughs> <laughs> You have a very good point there. I have not thought about that, but here we are, um, the whole world dying and rebirthing. It's it's so interesting and exciting to be alive right now. <laughs> Simon, I want people to know, um, tell people a little bit more about where to find you, if you have anything upcoming. We will put your links here in the show notes and all over wherever this podcast is is found. But yeah, tell people a little bit more about What's up for you? Sure, yeah. Um, what's up for me? Well, I'm going to be speaking at the Mount Tam Psilocybin Summit in a few yeah. weeks, which I don't know when this episode will air, but mid-September, um, mm-hmm. come to the come to the 2021 Psilocybin Summit. That'll be fun. Um, I'm going to be I'm, giving I'm a talk. I'm supposed to speak too. <laughs> oh, nice. Great. Yeah. Cool. See you there. Um, so I'll be speaking at that. Um and what else? Um, Instagram is a great way to connect with me. If you just go to depth underscore medicine, um, depth like depth psychology, um, uh, more articles on psychedelics today coming out. I'll be, you know, doing the, this column with them called psychedelics and depth, which I'm really excited Ooh. about. Um, Kyle. and then <laughs> what's that with, with Kyle, who's, Yep, he loves Kyle. talking about darkness too. Yeah, totally, great. Totally, yeah. Awesome. Kyle and I are <laughs> definitely on the same page. Um, and then, yeah, my website is depthmedicine.com. And I think I have some kind of uh, little email course about doing shadow work um, that mm. people can sign up for. The site is a bit of a work in progress. Um, but yeah, <laughs> stay in touch with me. You know, Instagram's a great, a great way, like I said. Um, mm. Micro Meditations. I'm there off and on throughout the year um, and just reach out. Awesome. Yeah, we'll have all the links. Yes, Mount Tam, definitely don't miss the Psilocybin Summit. It's been amazing the last few years. I also have a summit coming up after his summit. Um, Mine airs, I think, two weeks later. Psychedelic Sacred Medicine's Purpose and Business, exploring this interconnection between purpose and this path. Um, Simon, this is amazing. We'll make sure everybody gets your links. And please do any kind of shadow work course that Simon has. Um, This is so important. And I know it sounds scary for those of you who might not know what it is, but it's probably the best thing you could possibly do for yourself at this time in history. So... (laughs) Thank you, Simon, for being with us. It was such an honor to have you here. Thanks so much, Beth. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Thank you. And be sure to tune in next week to a new episode, and we'll see you then. I hope you enjoyed the episode. 
If you're feeling inspired, I'd appreciate it if you showed your love with a review. And check out my YouTube channel where you can find the video version of this podcast. You can also head to BethAWeinstein.com to learn more about me and grab my free business growth trainings. Remember, you carry your own unique medicine and your medicine is what we need for these times. 